Well, good morning. Okay, as we uh, dig into God's Word, uh, we just read Malachi 3 as God spoke to us, and now we're digging in our third installment in a series on faith. So I uh, don't know if you've heard this, but in 1799, Conrad Reed discovered a 17-pound rock while fishing in Little Meadow Creek. Now, I don't know what's so big about this because I've gone fishing a lot and I've discovered lots of rocks, but I didn't haul them home, especially if they were 17 pounds. But anyway, he found this uh, and not knowing what it was made of, he thought it was pretty, so he brought it home and his family used it for a doorstop for years. Finally, three years later in 1802, his father, John Reed, took it to a jeweler in town to identify what that rock was, that 17-pound rock, only to find out that it was a 17-pound lump of gold, which they sold at that time for about $3,600. That lump of gold had been used for a doorstop for three years in North Carolina, and it's one of the biggest gold nuggets ever found east of the Rockies. Now, the price of gold in 1802 was $19.39 an ounce. Woohoo! The current price of gold is $1,899.80 as of last Thursday, making the value of that rock today after the impurities were removed to be roughly $352,722.01. A pretty darn expensive doorstop for three years, wasn't it? You see, until the rock's composition was determined, the value of that rock was unknown. And that's kind of like us in our faith. The composition of our faith is undetermined and its strength is unknown until the composition of our faith is actually revealed. And that's why God allows trials to happen in our lives, not to hurt us, but to strengthen us and actually to prove the authenticity and the genuineness and the value of our faith. We've looked at the importance of growing in our faith for two weeks now, and we continue today with week three, and I'm sure you all have had wonderful weeks as we talk about God growing us by testing us in our faith, and God does test our faith. But the testing of our faith, unlike we typically see it, is really a good thing. Sometimes the way God tests our faith seems harsh to us on the onset, and it seems harsh for two reasons as we remember this. First, because we don't understand God's way of doing things, right? God says in his word, my ways are what? Not your ways, and your ways are not my ways. So from our point of view, it doesn't line up. It doesn't make sense. We can't exactly comprehend why God would grow our faith in that horrible, awful testing way. But in God's way, there's a purpose. As he changes us from temporal beings to eternal beings, as he takes us from grade school Christianity to collegiate PhD Christianity as he grows us, the second issue is because we are human and we still struggle with that old sinful nature, right? And that old sinful nature, as it rebels against God, wants to be what? In charge, in control. We want to have a grasp on what we can do that we are not under authority, but we are the authority, right? We want to make our own decisions based off of our perception, our experience, and our life. Well, you're in good company along with me because in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, it states this. For even though they knew God, they did not honor God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So this issue of when God tests our faith and we get frustrated with it or don't understand it or just kind of actually reject it is because like these folks in Romans, we may know God, but because we don't understand his way of doing things, we don't honor him as God. And that was the issue in Romans. So this morning what we want to answer is the question of our motivation, um, our faith in God and allowing God to grow us in his way and why that's important. Because we don't want to be like the people that Paul spoke about in the book of Romans where they knew God, so they were aware of him, they knew about him, they knew the history, they knew God, but they did not what? Honor God. And they became wise in their own mind, and God says they became idiots. They became foolish, right? Now, do we see any of that going on in the world today? 
people professing to be wise, and you look, you go, you're just an idiot. You're just stupid. I mean, you're, you're a moron, right? So, I mean, it's, it's still real today. So let's talk about our motivation and trusting God in faith. Because, again, faith, if you break it down, the old icon is um, forsaking all, I trust him, F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him, right? That we go on God's way, irrelevant of whether we understand it or not. We talked about last week that just because God allows something to happen to grow us in faith, we don't have to understand it, right? We just have to obey and obey immediately. So let's look at it this way. Let's kind of challenge ourselves and our perception of our own faith. That's always a fun thing to do in the morning, right? You love, you love that? Just kind of like we preach about faith and then you got a week to apply it and live it. That's always a great thing, right? So let's take this. Let's say I took a 20 foot long, 10 inch wide, two inch deep board and I laid it on the ground and I said, tell you what, you walk across that entire board and when you get to this side, I will give you 20 bucks. Well, what you gonna do? You gonna walk across it? Some of you wouldn't because you're like, John, we know you, there's a trick in here somewhere, but no, there's not. You walk across the board, I give you 20 bucks. Are you gonna do it? Of course you are, it's an easy 20 bucks. From your perception, there is no risk. There's only gain, right, from your perception? Now, let's take that same board, let's take that same 20 bucks, let's take that same test, but this time, I'm going to put it between two roofs on a 20-foot story building. Now from your perception, things have changed, right? But really when you look at it, the reward is still the same. It's still 20 bucks. The test is still the same. You just have to walk across the board. Everything's the same except the location and your perception. Now. If you're 20 stories up and that board's across those two roofs and I'm on the other side saying, come here, step on over and I'll give you 20 bucks, what's going to happen? How many of you are going to cross that? Oh, Lord's going to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> the kid would crawl across, but he could cross. Half our congregation would do it. Half wouldn't, yeah. right? Yeah. Ken's like, I'm up for a challenge. I'm up. I'm a I'm a drilling I junkie, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Ropes course. Laura's going with you. You guys can balance each other out, tie a little rope on each other. So half of our congregation would do it. The other were like, uh, uh. Christy's like, no way <laughs> would I do that. But really, everything's still the same. No, it's, except for the risk, which isn't. The same. Well, if you stay on the board, there's no risk. Hmm. There's still risk. Ten now, <laughs> ten inch wide. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's yeah. like. Uh, yes. <laughs> We're not talking a little bal four inch balance beam here. We're talking ten inches, you know. So <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, little, okay, yeah. Now let's go one step further. Let's change it up a little again. Now let's take that same twenty story building, that same ten by two by what do we say? Twenty, 20 feet. That board still be I, I gotta catch up with myself a little bit. We put that across there, we say, now I want you to cross that, but it's no longer 20 bucks. Because on the other side of that other building is the person you love most in life. Whether it be a spouse, a spouse, um, um, I mean, he's out. <laughs> a spouse, a, a parent, a child, a grandchild, a friend. The person you love the most is on the other side of that building. And here's the catch, the reward, the consequence. If you cross it, they stay alive. If you don't, they don't. They better be nice to me. Nice knowing Yeah. Now here's the reality. We would still have some people that there's no way in their own self-preservation they're going to cross that, right? Because their perception is still too dangerous. We would have others that even in light of fear and not understanding and all this worry, they would cross it because their perception, their motivation is that person is important enough for them to take the risk to cross it. Now when it comes to faith, that's kind of how we deal with things sometimes, right? If we look at it and God allows us this test to grow in faith, like we've talked about, and it seems like there's no risk, whoo, we're all in, right? <laughs> yeah, I can do that. I, I can handle that. But if the situation is slightly changed, the test is the same, the whole reward is the same, but the situation's changed a little bit, and we don't understand it or we fear it, well, now we're a little bit more reluctant 
to do this, right? Then we added a third option and we put something very valuable on the end of that and say, well, now here's the same test of faith, but if you don't follow through, something really bad is going to happen. But if you do follow through, something really good, like saving a life, is going to happen. That's how we deal with faith a lot. And it comes down to our perception again of how we view the test. Irrelevant of God just saying, I know you can do it. I'm just asking you to do it to grow in your faith. So last week, in the last two weeks, we've looked at two of the most common ways that God tests our faith. And uh, the first one, everyone was here, we read about it, it's like, God tests our faith through difficulties. Now, we don't like that, but God grows our character in that. That was such an invigorating message that Ellen skipped the next week. <laughs> No, sorry, Ellen, I just had to have fun a little bit. We came in the next week, and, and the next week's message was God tests our faith through demands upon us, commands that God wants us to do that challenge us because they, in essence, move us out of our comfort zone. They, in essence, cause us to step out of our perception and into the world of God to do things His way, to see it through heavenly eyes, such as loving our enemies. Ooh, joy, joy, right? Considering it all joy when we go through difficulties. Well, our human nature doesn't want to do that. And that's where God says, this is my command, my demand upon you to do this, to grow out of your temporal self into your future eternal self. That's what I'm trying to get you to do, to grow in that character. So we looked at that um, in those two ways. And today we look at the third most common way that God grows our faith and tests our faith. Are you ready for this week? Ellen shaking her head going, no, I'm probably with you. <laughs> it's simply this. God tests our faith with our dollars. God tests our faith with our dollars. I'm talking about money. I'm talking about materialistic things that you own. I'm talking about your resources. Um, and in doing that, do you know that that's one of the greatest ways that God tests your faith? Is with your finances? Few people understand how God uses our material possessions and our finances as a, as a test of character as a, and a test of faith. Um, but God tests our faith with our money. Many people have no idea that if they go in debt, how they deal with that debt is a test from God. Many people have no idea that when they're having financial problems, how they deal with those financial problems as a Christian is a test from God. And I'm talking specifically about Christians. Most people have no idea about when they're asked to give to God and tithing and to give sacrificially, that's a test of God. Most people have no idea that when God gives them possessions and wealth and materialism and finances, how they handle those things is a test of faith. But it is, isn't it? For the Christian, all those things have to do with faith. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16, verse 11. Luke 16, 11. It's interesting what's said here about materialism and, and temporal worldly wealth for the Christian. We read this in Luke 16, 11. If, again, conditional statement if, which means you have a choice, right? If, it's that conditional statement, that conditional word. It says, if you haven't or have not been trustworthy in handling what? worldly wealth, finances, possessions, materialistic things, if you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth to the Christian, what's the next thing say? Who will trust you with what? True riches, real riches, things that are really important. In other words, God's saying all the stuff you have, all the money you have, in my view, is really pretty darn insignificant. Because there are things of so much more value, especially eternally. He's like, I could make anything. I could make you wealthy. I could make you poor at a moment's notice. I could change your world. All the stuff, all the money you have is insignificant to me. But there are riches that are truly valuable. And what God is saying, he says, in the depth of your spiritual life, God's saying, how can I trust you with something truly valuable if I can't trust you with what? the insignificant stuff I've given you, the, the stuff that comes and goes, that rust and decays, the, the stuff that 
eventually becomes rubble and blows away. How can I trust you with true riches if I can't trust you with little things? As we've read it many times before, if you're faithful in small, you'll be faithful in much. If you're not faithful in small, you won't be faithful in much. God is saying these materialistic things that you have, resources, finances, God's like, from my point of view, they're really nothing. But I do have true riches. And what God is saying, he goes, he's in essence implying, he goes, I want to trust you with these true riches. I want to give them to you to allow you to be responsible for them. I mean, God's looking at saying, I want to give you stuff of real value, but I can't because why? Because the insignificant stuff I've given you, you, you don't take care of it. Now this hits me at home because I tend to be a little materialistic and kind of on the edge beginning hoarder sometimes, right? Hoarder porter, that's kind of how it goes. I have a lot of stuff. It fills my garage, it fills my house, and when I find new places to fill it, I tend to fill it, right? But God is asking me, and here's where this hits home for me, is, John, what are you doing with your stuff that I've given you? I've blessed you, I've supplied you, what are you doing with it? You see, the thing is, if we want to see where our faith really stands, we can look at our checkbook, or we can look at our house. Now, that's a little convicting, isn't it? That's harsh. And I get that. But the reality is it makes no difference of your financial situation in God, whether you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. Whether you won the Idaho lottery or you're on subsidy, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if God has allowed you to work for the money that he's given you or it's a subsidy that he's just given it to you. The test for all is the same. God says, I want to see how you handle what I have given you, whether it's little or much in your eyes. Because in God's eyes, it's all insignificant. It's all a matter of a godly perspective over a worldly perspective. We look at it and say, well, he makes $100,000. I only make ten. Well, God's saying to me, it's nothing either way. He goes, the test is still the same in how you handle it. That's what I'm looking for. To see if you can handle handling nothing so I can give you responsibility over something truly valuable. The fact is, it makes, well, the fact is this. What I do with my money and my things literally determines how much God can bless me. Have you ever thought of it that way? I mean, that's more of a selfish way of looking at it. But we all want God to bless us, right? You've said those prayers. God, help me, bless me. God, get me through this. God, please give me this. You know, God, help me to do this. We want God to bless us. But all through Scripture, God does talk about that, that if you do things my way, God's blessing is upon us. Now, that doesn't always mean riches or anything, but God does bless us with things that are truly important. And with our finances, for many, and just the entry level into Christianity, it comes down to that tithe, where the Bible talks about a tithe or a tenth of giving that, in essence, back to God through the local church. The challenge is for us and I can share with you in my early years of marriage, this was really a challenge. The challenge of giving a minimum of 10% back to God was hard. Even the challenge of putting 10% in a savings account was hard because the inclination was what? To spend it. We come up with excuses like, well, God, I gotta pay bills. And God's like, well, manage your money better. Get a second or third job. It's like, well, God, I, I need this vacation so bad because i got to take a break. And God's like, well, manage your work better, right? Early in my marriage, it was a real issue for me, um, which is kind of ironic because here in my early marriage life with Christy, luckily God gave me a godly woman that kept reminding me that we needed the tithe, which was really a good thing. A little irritable at the time, but really a good thing. Because I was working for God, as a Christian, in a church, making $16,000 a year. Now here I am a Christian, in fact, I'm on staff at the church, making $16,000, and I kept saying, well, honey, we just can't give because we're only making $16,000, and God will understand. Well, the reality was, 
I didn't understand. Because again, it doesn't matter whether I'm making 16,000 or 160,000, the test of my faith was the same, right? Luckily, God gave me this woman to keep me or to get me on track, to keep reminding me. And she was faithful. She was a good wife in the fact that she didn't make me do it. But she's like, we really need to do this. We really need to do this. And I finally gave in. And that's when the blessings of God hit us. And I can't explain it to you, but I can tell you this from my own experience, which is neither here nor there. It's just my experience that I had. When I kept convincing myself that we didn't have, we didn't make enough money to tithe to God or to save money, that we just had enough to get by, when we finally started actually tithing, I don't know how God stretched that $16,000, but we had more money. We had more money that we could go down to the local bank and every paycheck we bought a little $50 savings bond. Not much, but it was a start in savings. That when we were faithful to God with the little bit that we had, it's like God just took that and stretched that. The story in the Bible of the woman who had nothing. And the prophet says, go get your oil. Get everything you have and we're going to fill it up. And the oil kept flowing and flowing and flowing, right? That it doesn't make sense to us, but God blesses it. The problem with me was that even as a Christian, I was like the Romans, or like the Corinthians that, the, that Paul talks about in Romans, that I knew God, but I didn't honor him. Have you fallen in that same trap? You know God. You know his blessings. But we don't honor him. We make excuses. And maybe your excuse was really the same as mine. It wasn't about being godly. It was about self, what? Preservation. It was about me. I've got to make it through. I've got to get by. I've got to be okay irrelevant of my responsibility or my desire to serve God, I have to be okay. Can you relate with that? Have you been in that position where it's like, we are so good at making excuses of why we can't be faithful and why God, as I said it myself, will understand. Well, the problem is God doesn't understand. God gets it. He's got it black and white, very clear. It's me who didn't understand. <clears throat> It's me who actually limited God and what he could do in my life because I was unfaithful with the little bit that he gave me. Well, this is probably the biggest area of my life I've grown in my faith, that God is taking me from that to where we are today. And we've been in and out of work. We've been in small houses, big houses. We've rented, we've owned, we've had stuff. But God has blessed us because we are faithful to honor God. You see, some people get upset because they're like, well, God just blesses them so much and doesn't do anything for me. But what we realize this, it's not God who determines how much we're blessed. Do you know who it really is? I mean, God has a say in it, definitely. He chooses whether he makes us instruments of honor or just earthenware instruments of everyday common use. But as far as the blessings of God in our life, it's us who determines that. Because again, we go back to Luke, if we can't be faithful with worldly things, how in the world could we handle true things of spiritual value? God just says it doesn't work, you know? It's a lot of talk, but it doesn't work. And that's where God has worked in my life. And that's where God gives us that test of faith in our finances and our possessions. And for Americans, that typically hits home pretty hard, right? I read this last week a couple testimonies of people that really challenged me in the stretching of my faith and what I was allowing God to do in my life. One of them was this. There was a family out east that was selling their large home and moving into a smaller home on purpose. Do you know why? So they could help their church buy the lot to put a new church there. They chose to leave the abundance of a large home to move into a smaller home and give the remaining money to the church over and above their tithe so the church could build a new building to bring in more Christians. A couple of months later, there was a family that was remodeling, going to remodel their house, and they decided they would wait because the property had been purchased, but they put off remodeling their house and took the money they saved and gave to that church. Do you know why? So they could build the building now that the land was purchased. The faith of the one family helped buy the land. The faith of the second family helped start putting bricks up in a structure. 
Another lady who didn't have quite as much money had just bought a nice dress that she was wearing to a special event. She took the dress back, got the cash back, wore an old dress to the event, and gave that to the church over and above her tithe to bless and honor God so the church building could be built. Another guy decided he didn't have a lot of extra stuff to get rid of, but he smoked. He gave up smoking and he took all the money from the cigarettes that he would have spent and he gave it to that church over and above their tithing to build the building. And we're like, yay for them. <laughs> Don't look at me, right? <laughs> Isn't that kind of what goes through my mind? Well, yeah, those are great people, but you know, I'm in this situation. We jump back to the excuses again. And God has to be bigger than our excuses. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. As Paul speaks to us again, just like he did in, in Romans, that one was a negative, right? The people knew God, but they didn't trust him. They didn't honor him. Now he speaks to us in 2 Corinthians, and he gives us a command to do something. He says, excel. What does excel mean? Go over and above, go all out, 137%. Excel, go, just go all in, right? Excel in the grace of what? Of giving. Excel in the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. Hmm. Hmm. That sounds like a pretty verse we put on a refrigerator, right? Or in a Hallmark card. But then we realize the impact of it. Paul says, I, I want you to go above and beyond in your giving. And however you give that. I want you to go beyond what is asked of you to give. Because I want to test the sincerity, the authenticity, the genuineness. He doesn't say faith. What does he say? Of your love. Your love for God. Did you know that Paul compared the giving of the Corinthian Christians with the Macedonian Christians? You know, I'm in sales, and a lot of times they do these quirky little things of they post openly for everybody to see who is excelling and who is not. It's, to me, kind of like public shaming sometimes, unless you're <laughs> in that winning bracket, right? You don't want to be the person on the bottom of that list, right? Because it goes out in public. You want to be the person on top. But Paul compared the giving of the Corinthian Christians to the Macedonian Christians. And then he tells us here in the 2 Corinthians, he says, I want to test the sincerity of your faith and your love by how you give. He goes, I want you to excel in that. Because part of the thing that Paul is saying is, I'm hoping that you've come to the reality that you're living eternally and not temporally. That you're not looking at your stuff like, look what I have. And look what more I can get. But you're looking at it from a heavenly point of view saying, this stuff is nice. This money is nice. But God is better. God is greater. My love for him is bigger than my love for myself and what I have. And again, for American Christians, this can be a challenge. I'm always amazed that... Um, in past years, when we would talk about some of these verses and some of the stuff about giving and seeing it God's view versus our view about how many people got upset about those messages and would talk to me privately or call me later. What I realized, what it was typically the people that were not giving consistently that were the ones who were upset with these messages. Do you know the people who had no problem with these messages? The ones who were faithful and understood God's way and gave. They had no problem with it because they understood the blessing that God was testing them and God would also bless them. You see, every time I give or I give something up or I give something away, you know what it does for me spiritually? And I hate to say this because I deal with this a lot personally. It breaks the grip of materialism on my life. You know that Satan can get a foothold on us through materialism? And every time I just give stuff away, it breaks that grip of materialism on our life. It's like, ah, don't eat it. I have something greater eternally in God. I don't need that. Now, I still like stuff, 
you can ask Christy. I have a lot of stuff. But it was interesting, the last, or the four months that we were on furlough, we decided to finally clean out our garage because cleaning out our garage is always something that, well, when we have time to do that, we just don't have it now. Well, God gave us four months to have time. Great thing to have a three-car garage and only barely be able to pull one car in. It was really a bad testimony. But as we're going through that stuff, what I found out was there was stuff in there that we had not touched for years, decades. This just gets convicting more and more as I go along. But that stuff was there, and I finally had to come to the point of, for most of it, I won't say all of it, but for most of it, it's like, you know what? We haven't used this. We just got to get rid of it. We'll try selling it like a little yard sale and then the rest of it we just start giving stuff away. But the challenging thing for me in thinking about this message and what God is saying to us is what I found was the emotional connection I had with some of that stuff. Yeah, I had these things I hadn't given away for years. They really don't even fit my lifestyle now. But we may need them someday. We could use them someday, right? You know what I'm talking about? You realize that? And it's just been sitting there. We've been storing this for no reason. So for me, this is a real challenging message. And even though I've understood it in our tithing, it hits me more on the materialism side. First Chronicles 29 in the Old Testament tells us about David and the nation of Israel as David is king. And God called them to build him a temple. In essence, God called them to build him a church. And he called King David and the people to give a single offering for the temple, for the church, to raise the money. Well, if you read second or if you read First Chronicles 29, it was probably the most successful building campaign in history because most theologians put the amount given in one offering to be a little over four hundred million dollars. Man, that's one heck of a temple, isn't it? That's one heck of a church. What I love about the story in 1 Chronicles 29 is this. If you jump into verse 14 specifically, they have gathered all they had and gave it freely to the Lord to build his church, his temple. But then David comes in verse 14 and states this. Who am I, Lord? Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have given you what comes from where? Your hands. O oh Lord, our God, in all this abundance that you have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand and it all belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things that I have given willingly with honest intent, and now I see... With joy, your people who are here have given to you. What David and the people realized is what we talk about, but we have a hard time applying it sometimes in our, in our life, is that every good gift, everything we have as Christians, doesn't come from the sweat of our brow and the calluses and work of our hands. It comes from where? It comes from the Lord and how God chooses to give to us little or much. It all comes from God so that when we give, really all we're doing is giving back to God what he already owns. Now that changes our mindset, doesn't it? That takes it from, well, I own this and I have that. And don't get me wrong, it's not wrong to own things. It's not. That's not what it's about. It's about the motivation and faith and the intent of the heart in honoring God first. That's what it's about. It's about loving God more than I love myself. It's about loving God more than I love my bank account. It's about loving God more than I love my stuff. It's not wrong to have stuff. God blessed his people with stuff and finances throughout the Bible. But it's about the intent of the heart. You don't believe that? Look at Job. God allowed Job to be tested and stripped everything away from him, allowed Satan to take it, his family, his his income, his possessions. But then we get to the end of Job, and what happens? Well, he was blessed double over from what he had before. You see, the Lord 
giveth and the Lord can take away and the Lord can give again. It was about the intent of Job's heart. Look at the apostles. Peter specifically, where God says, Peter, the devil has asked to sift you like wheat. In other words, to test you. And Jesus kind of says, I'm going to let it happen, dude. Peter wasn't too excited about that. But what Peter learned through that was how to manage the little that he had so God could entrust to him the ministry of early Christianity to grow the church and bring people to salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you see the trade-off? Peter struggled with the little things. Remember, God brought the Peter's on the roof, and he's a, a good good uh, Jewish boy, right? And he's like, well, I don't want to let anything unclean touch my mouth. I don't eat pork chops, right? I don't eat bacon. Oh, dude was missing out, right? And God brings the sheet down while Peter's dreaming on there. God has to do it three times to finally get to Peter. And Peter's like, I haven't done anything unclean. And God says, Peter, dude, eat the hickory smoked bacon. is awesome. It's okay. Peter struggled with food in that way, in a simple way, but he also struggled with pe people, right? There was a point in time where Peter, Peter had trouble going to the Gentiles because he just didn't make connect the dots. He didn't get the crossover. He had to be confronted again. But once Peter finally understood through those tests of his perception, and he was able to move into God's view instead of his perception, then God entrusted him with ministry and with much. Do you see the trade-off? Again, like that board at the beginning, 20 foot board, 10 inches wide, two inches thick. The test is the same. All you gotta do is what? Go from one side to the other and there's a reward. What messes us up? Our perception of the risk. That comes back to self-preservation. That's the issue we struggle with this. The last couple of weeks, we've looked at three tests of faith. The first was God tests us through difficulties, and in that, the application was to learn to rejoice always, to not be negative and down, but to rejoice always because we knew God was growing our faith. The second one was God tests us in his demands or his commands upon our life. And what that taught us was that we need to learn to obey immediately. When God says, we do. This week we talk about God tests our faith with our finances and our possessions. And the application is simply this. We need to learn to give with the right attitude, generously. The Bible calls it what? Uh, what kind of giver? A hilarious giver. You know, we always talk about the side of, being a hilarious giver that God just says, just give it all away and laugh about it. That's not quite the point. But I think sometimes the rival refers to it as a hilarious giver because how do you think the world looks at you when you give so generously? <laughs> they are nuts, man. What are they doing? You know, Christie's father still struggles with the fact that we give a tithe. He's like, you know what you could do with that money? Over the last 30, 40 years you've been in church, what you could have done with that? Yeah. <laughs> We could have halted God's blessings on our life and screwed things up really, really bad. We could have really messed it up of God being able to bless us and use us. That's what we could have done, right? But from the world's point of view, does that make sense? Absolutely not. The Bible even says that the word of God and his ways are foolishness to them who don't understand. It doesn't make sense because they don't have the spirit to change their perception and make them eternal and not temporal. Partially trusting God to me is like being a Christian chicken nugget. You got parts and pieces that you trust God with and you leave the other stuff out, right? Fact is, God wants the whole chicken. He doesn't want us to be Christian chicken nuggets. He wants the whole chicken, right? Last week was two hours. This week, I'm asking you, be the chicken. Be the whole chicken for God. We're going to get shirts that say that. I am a chicken for God, right? There's many applications for that. We won't go there. But it's about trusting God in faith and giving him everything. And when we see it from God's point of view, it's not hard. Do you know why? 
because it's all already what? Yes. He just loaned it to us for a while. He just let us have it for a little while. And that's okay. And that's okay. God wants our heart. And he tests that in our possessions, in our finances. And it's not always just about giving them away. Please understand that. It's also about how we manage them and handle them. As a church, we've gone through financial peace two times now on how to manage the money that God has given us to where we use it for our good and not just to be selfish, not to blow it because we have it, right? But to manage that. So it's not just about giving away. I'm not telling you to go back home today and just give everything away. That may not be what God's saying, but maybe what God is saying is, how do you manage what you have? How do you take care of what I've already given you? Because the implication of the verses we read earlier was, if you can handle what I've given you, then what else can you handle? Things of real value, spiritual things. So it's not just, I'm not saying give it away. That may not be it. God may just be saying, you and I need to learn to manage things a little better. We need to be better stewards, better caretakers, of the little bit that God has given us. And when you think about that, I know when we went through financial peace, some of it was pretty challenging, actually tracking everything I spent money on and then being accountable for that. But what that has done is also has helped us over the years to have enough to share with others. That's the management. So God says, in the nation of Israel, he tells them clearly when you read through the Bible, I don't want you to be the people borrowing money. What does God tell them? I want you to be the people that have and loan to others because it puts you in a different position. And then I want you to do it with a right attitude. That's what God's calling us to do. So as we realize in this third installment of how does God grow us in our faith, it's in how we handle the money and possessions that God's given us. That's what it comes down to. So how are you doing? Nobody answered all at once. <laughs> but how are you doing? And if you realize, maybe God is challenging me in this. Well, that's a good thing, kids. Because it changes how we live. It breaks the grip of materialism and self-preservation from our life. And it puts us in a place of trusting and faith in a God who can right? That's what it's really about. It's really a good thing. So let's pray. Father in heaven, as you, <laughs> you, you, you confront us where we live and in what we have and don't have and how we handle those things, we pray, Lord, that we would hear your word in context and, and not do some knee-jerk reaction to try and honor you on the spur of the moment for a week or two, but Lord, that we would get the context of what you're telling us and how we handle the things that you give us and loan us to be able to be more responsible and handle, handle real things of value. To be in that spiritual realm to see through your eyes and not our perception. We pray, Lord, that in this faith of trusting you with our possession and our finances and the, the care of those, that, Lord, you would grow us. You would put us in a place to help other people, to help other ministries, a place to be the one who provides, and not only the one who has to receive. Because Lord, it's you that provide all that we have. And we've just borrowed it. We thank you and praise you for that. And we pray that we would grow in this area of our life in you, that the world would not have a grip on us through materialism or selfishness or self-preservation but that our hope, our trust, our love, our faith would not be in our finances and bank account, but it would be in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.